All right, on today's podcast, we have a man who needs no introduction, David Sachs. David is obviously famous for being part of the PayPal Mafia, for starting Yammer, and now he is the host of the All In Podcast and the founder of a new podcasting platform called Call In, which is where we originally recorded this episode, which you can also download Call In, and you can listen to the episode on there as well which comes with some cool features like being able to see who is listening in real time. It was in front of an audience of around 300 people. You can comment on there and reply to other comments. You can like it. Um, it's a great app if you haven't downloaded it already. And so today's conversation, we talk about call-in. We talk about the philosophical underpinnings of why David went ahead and started call-in. I think it's definitely a mission-driven company. And I know that there's going to be a lot of cool features that are rolling out soon. Um, we also talk a lot of politics. So we get David's opinion on this proposed unrealized cap gains tax. We talk about the debt crisis, obviously, for listeners of this podcast. Uh, we talk about a strategy for a viable third party. Um, and then we wrap up with some talk around uh, his career producing movies. So connecting the dots there. So hopefully you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's press play. Well, let's get going. I know we have you for an hour here. So I want to make uh, make the most of that time. And I really appreciate you doing this. This is uh Definitely one I've wanted to do for a while, having been a uh, an all in listener for a while now, and uh, so I wanted I wanted to get started actually when I when I first went to uh, I, I went to the archives of the all in podcast because I think I started listening around the beginning of of twenty twenty one, and I saw that actually like the first episode or two you were not on there. So what what was the origin story? of all and I, mean, I know the kind of the the segue into to podcasting and getting a call in we'll get into that but what was the origin story of of all in and and how that got started given you weren't on the first episode yeah it started when i think chamath talked to jason about doing a pod covid had just started and i don't know if this is something he had wanted to do before but i guess everyone was kind of trapped in their houses and was a little bit bored and Chamath had this idea of, well, what if we just recorded ourselves at the poker table because we have all these interesting conversations? So that had been sort of the background idea. And then uh, Jason and Chamath started doing it. And I think Freeberg was actually the guest on episode one. And then I was a guest on episode two. And then on episode three, we had the four of us. And it sort of clicked. And then that was the format from then on as we kind of stuck with that, that foursome. Um, nobody really expected it to become the, the hit that, or, you know, in terms of by podcasting standards, I think that it's since become. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely a hit. Um, I mean, it's, it's been refreshing because, you know, we talk about the narrative monopoly and why I named that, um, the name of my podcast is, I I believe there is a, a monopoly on narrative. And I think that we're still in the early innings of having people like yourself or actual practitioners be able to weigh in on issues of the day um, rather than people kind of just commenting and going and writing their, you know, 800 words and then moving on to the next thing. Um, And so it's been really refreshing. Yeah. I mean, we call it going direct and we've had this conversation on, on the pod, um, particularly the episode with uh, Draymond Green, if anyone wants to check that out where he was a, we call it a bestie guestie. Um, He's uh, he's a friend of ours who who plays poker with us, and we we had a long conversation about the idea of going direct. The basic problem is just that the corporate media has such an agenda, you know, whether it's um, you know whether it's a political agenda or just an agenda to get clicks, uh, you know, that you're frequently just not covered in a fair way. And so, if you can tell your story directly, it's uh, it's a much better place to be. Yeah. So now did that play into the, uh, the decision to start call in, you know, in terms of kind of like the, you know, you're obviously a huge first amendment advocate, um, have been very open about, uh, the problem of, of, you know, these kind of these, uh, these tech platforms working to deplatform people kind of in, in conjunction with the corporate media, did that play into the role of, of starting call in? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, there are a couple of things going on there. You know, one is creator economy. We want to enable anyone to be able to create a podcast. Um, and, you know, I think Colin is by far the simplest way of doing it. All you got to do is push a button, start talking. The room gets saved, you know, as you know, as part of a show. And so we're enabling people to to go out there and, you know, go direct, you know, build their own shows, build their own pods. And all they really need is a iPhone and something interesting to say. So that's a huge part of it. And then, you know, another part is that I do think that social audio is a big wave, maybe one of the last social waves. And I could see that what was happening on other platforms is the same thing that happened with social networking general generally is they were hiring the same trust and safety people. They were setting the stage for deplatforming. And I thought it was important that if we could create um, the, the winning kind of social audio platform that we could, um, you know, that we could set a standard that would be, you know, much more open to free speech. What, what is the long-term vision in terms of, both that policy towards, um, you know, free speech. And then also, you know, I would love to have you get into the, the product roadmap roadmap. Um, I was speaking to Charlie earlier and he said, you have some great features coming along soon. So what is that long, long long-term vision on both, both sides of the coin there? Yeah. So on, on speech, um, we, I guess we see it. There's a few things we take into consideration. Number one is, um, the, you know, unlike some other social audio platforms, which are really a many to many conversation, the, all the the rooms or episodes on call in are episodes of a show, and so there's a creator there, there's a host, and they control what gets said in the room. They can control who gets to speak, and then if somebody contributes content that's not you know worthwhile to the conversation, we have the sort of post production editing features. You can go and edit it out. So first of all, we're trying to enable the hosts of the show to put on the show they want, and when you see the room that way as episodes of a podcast, I think it's very different than again, being part of some like party line or, or many to many conversations. So I think it's very important to understand like who, whose speech we're trying to enable. And then with respect to the creator, uh, our view is that we want to give them as much speech as we can within the um, strictures of, you know, of the Apple app store, you know, and they have a bunch of requirements on what they allow that we have to enforce and so they're already pretty restrictive. So our view is that, you know, we're going to enforce all of those requirements because the last thing we want to do is become a free speech martyr. It doesn't do us any good if we try to set some policy that's at odds with Apple and then we get thrown off their platform. So we're not going to be a free speech martyr, but we're going to try and give creators the maximum creative and artistic freedom that's basically allowed within the Apple platform. Got it. Now, now, how about the uh, the product roadmap that's that's coming down? Does the, I have to ask you? Does, does the product have a distribution hook? Yeah, I mean, I think the distribution hook here is just the one tap sharing to other platforms. Um, it's just so easy to create audio and then share it all over the web, and you're going to see a lot more sharing features. Um, we have, I think, pretty decent. I guess you call it link sharing features, but we can do a lot better. You know, in terms of actually embedding the uh the audio inside of other sites whether they be websites or social platforms uh we want to enable you to be able to listen or really watch because as everyone can see here i mean a room isn't just a flat audio file it's actually interactive so letting you um kind of interact with call and audio across the web and across um mobile sites that that's going to be a big uh distribution hook that we're just getting started with that's great. That's great. Um, so let me let me ask one more question on uh, call in, and then we'll get into kind of the, the meatier part of the conversation, which is why uh, I think this is a good bridge to walk over. Why why did you change the name of your initial call in show from Red Pills to Purple Pills? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know the the show isn't really that partisan, I and mean, it's not partisan at all. We're just trying to find constructive answers to you know, to big problems or, you know, polarizing problems. And I did think that calling it, I, I understand the term red pilled. And I think, you know, m- mostly that term is used in a pretty innocuous way, but you know, we're not, it's, we're not like putting forth only like red politics. And I didn't want people to, I guess, 
misperceive that. Or I didn't want to alienate guests who might not identify with red politics, at, you know, and not want to come on the show. You know, we've had people who are more blue or purple on the show. So that was number one. I think, you know, the, the sense in which um, this term red pill comes from the matrix and there's nothing wrong with that, but it has acquired um, some, I guess some baggage you could say on certain corners of the internet. And I didn't want to inherit that, that sort of baggage, you know, that's not what we're referring to. So I just thought, you know, purple pills actually represents more of what we're going for, which is trying to find common sense answers to, to polarizing questions. Right. So maybe the, the, the operative part of that is, is more the, the pill as almost a, like a, in, in the sense of using it as a verb, um, like in the matrix sense, since it has been taken out of context from, from, from the actual movie. Um, uh, well, I think, you know, some, sometimes when I hear it used, like, for example, there's a bunch of like really interesting journalists and writers on Substack who used to be pretty left wing or liberal and now ha- are really speaking out against this sort of authoritarian tendency on the left, whether it be, um, you know, whether it be um, speech restrictions or censorship or um, repression of, of civil li- liberties through like crazy COVID edicts. Um, you know, the, the, as a category, I you know a lot of them are kind of known as kind of red pill journalists. I think that's fine. I think everyone understands what they're saying. But you know, this whole like red pilled um, moniker has also been used by different corners of the internet to mean different things. And again, it's just baggage I don't necessarily want. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's uh, you know, that's the tough part of of publishing, right? Is is the you know the the delta between what you intend and then how people perceive it and um you know it seems like historically there's just always going to be people who are gonna who are going to uh you know twist and turn your words um yeah and i, and I definitely want to find um you know liberals who uh, agree with me or, or want to engage in conversations about um these issues and uh you know i felt like that might be a little harder if they get turned off by the name of the show um you know we're really trying to operate in an area where we can convince people, you know, independents, people who are sort of between red and blue. I mean, that's sort of the, the target audience is, you know, I don't want to just be an echo chamber for people on the right. I actually want to be able to put forward ideas that can win over people on the left or in the center. And, you know, that's what we've tried to do more generally on the all in pod. Yeah, I, I do think that there is a, a growing constituency of Americans um, that, you you know, in everyday life that are becoming, you know, <laughs> I guess the, the best term here is red pilled, but it's, it's again, it's, you know, it comes with this tinge, but they're, they're you know, realizing the, the kind of like the information that has been, you know, relied upon in our society is actually not just this, um, you know, objective, uh, a kind of objective like retelling of what's going on between the 40 yard lines is actually, you know, very specific from where it's coming from. And now that there are other options. And I, again, I think we're in the early innings here, you know, there's other options with people on Twitter and what you're doing with the all in podcast, people are, are getting these different information streams that are at least stepping into them and, and realizing, wait a second, you know, the, the, the seven biggest media corporations are not actually giving me the whole picture here. Completely. I mean, there is such an agenda. I mean, whether it's from the New York Times to any of the you know mainstream corporate media outlets, I mean, there is such an incredible agenda, and people are seeing that. And you don't have to be right wing or conservative to see what's going on. And it seems like the agenda has has moved so far to the left that um, that even if you're just in the center, you feel alienated from it. And um, and I mean, I think that like we're speaking to a lot of those people. So, you know, there's one there's one specific point that you just tweeted about last night, um, specifically the, the widened provision. And there's all this, you know, all this dust that got kicked up over Secretary Yellen's comments around creating a tax on unrealized gains. Um, I wasn't planning on asking this, but it, it's quite topical, you know, from your perspective as someone who started companies and is now allocating companies or allocating capital to grow companies. What would this do to. Uh, the, the startup ecosystem and also just the, the capital markets at large. 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is a disaster in the making. So the, the basic idea is that you would tax unrealized gains on stocks. And so normally you only tax income once it's realized, meaning you sell the stock. Now you have the income to pay the tax bill. When you tax people on unrealized gains, it means that they have to pay a tax bill every year just because the value of the stock goes up. Well, how do they then pay that tax bill? They have to sell some of their stock in order to pay that bill. Now, this Wyden plan has actually been around since 2019. And when he introduced it, it applied to, to both millionaires and billionaires. And the uh, tax rate on it was 37%, which is basically the top ordinary income rate. We haven't seen the details on this current Wyden plan, but if history is any guide, that is the direction it's going. So the first thing is you can't really believe this idea that this is only going to apply to 700 billionaires. I mean, Wyden has every intention of expanding it over time to, you know, to millionaires as well as billionaires. And the fact of the matter is that if you apply it to millionaires, what you're really talking about is any successful company founder. Okay. Because the reality is in this day and age on paper, anybody who's got a successful startup has you know, any founder has a million dollars of equity and really, it doesn't take. I mean, even a Series A company that raises, say, um, you know, money at a typical like forty, fifty million dollar valuation, which is low, like the founders on paper have millions of dollars of equity. Now, that is not necessarily going to translate into real wealth or real income, but it's the motivation. So, now what happens in this world of taxing and realized gains? Well, every year in success, the value of your company goes up. That means the value of your stock goes up, which means you have to sell a bunch of your stock. And at a 37 point, 37% rate, you'd be selling like almost half of it. Um, and I would expect states to get on the act too. So state like California would you know, try to get in on its 13.3% income tax rate. So you know, you'd be talking about 50, you're selling 50% of your stock every year to cover this tax bill. So, so basically every year that the company is doing well, the founder's ownership gets cut in half until the point where their ownership is just negligible on paper. I mean, think about this. This would destroy the whole entrepreneurial economy where what you want is it's exactly the wrong feedback loop, right? The great thing about the American system is that as a founder keeps doing well and as their company does well, their market cap goes up, it attracts more investment, that creates more resources that the founder can now use to work with, and they can expand what they're doing. So take an Elon Musk, right? This is a guy who starts with nothing, and 20 years later, he's got the resources to send people to Mars, right? That's because in that 20 years, he's proven that he knows what he's doing, and so the market rewards him with more capital. If he had to sell roughly half of his shares every year, 20 years later, he would have negligible ownership and he wouldn't have the same level of motivation to keep creating what he's creating. So, I mean, this is a real, I think, uh, you know, this, this is almost like a crazy idea that would totally upend our entire entrepreneurial system. And I don't think they've thought it through at all. I mean, to be proposing this at the 11th hour, they haven't done any hearings on this, no committee markups. They haven't heard from witnesses. Other European countries have tried something like this and had to repeal it because it did so much damage. It never ends up raising as much tax as you think because it scares so many rich people out of your country and people stop creating businesses uh, in your country. So, you know, countries like France have had to repeal stuff like this. So it's just amazing to me that uh, this is seriously on the table right now. Now, wouldn't, wouldn't that also apply to someone who owns a restaurant or someone who owns, you know, a small real estate company that even if they own, you know, a few properties and they're, they're leasing them out, like wouldn't, wouldn't that apply as well? Eventually. I mean, so right now they're saying, well, no, 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 we're not going to get the little guy. This just applies to billionaires. And that is version one of the bill. But once they have passed this and applied it to basically creating a whole new tax system, right? I mean, basically it's a, it's a kind of wealth tax where you're taxing and realized gains. Once that principle exists, you know, the whole way they're going to pass it is by saying, well, this only affects 700 people. So you, the average voter, shouldn't care about it. Well, let's say they pass it. Now, the next step would be, well, we'll apply it to people who've got 100 million because there's only a few thousand of those. So you, the average voter, shouldn't care. And then they'll do 10 million and then they'll eventually do 1 million. So this is absolutely the camel's nose under the tent. And this is not like speculation on my part. The original Wyden proposal 
where he originally proposed this back in 2019, applied it from the start to millionaires and billionaires. So if you let this alternative tax code be created, there's no question of what direction it's heading. And in any event, I think this whole idea of judging a tax based on you know, who it impacts and, well, it only affects 700 billionaires, so the rest of us shouldn't care about it. That's really the wrong way of looking at it because all the rest of us should want a healthy economy. And so the question is, what damage will this tax do? What unintended consequences will it have? How many jobs will it destroy? How much innovation will it dampen? Those are the types of questions we should be asking. And the idea, well, this only affects 700 people, so the rest of us shouldn't care. That's a really bad way of looking at it. Now, there's, there's two different theories on this and the second one you just touched on but the first would be that basically this is just a diversion right so they're having trouble getting this thing over the line they can't get mansion and and cinema on board and so basically you just plant the flag way way farther and you say you know you get people all riled up about this and then then they pull it back and then all of a sudden where they were doesn't look as radical as it was um so that's that's kind of where I think is is going with this, because as you alluded to, this is the second point, um, you know, I really want to get into debt, which you you talked about on All In two weeks ago. The second point- Well, can I respond respond to that point? So so I think you're right. I mean, there's certainly a lot of speculation that this is kind of like a shock and awe tactic where they're going to propose something so awful that a regular rate increase- no longer seems nearly as bad, and that maybe that will be the the, the fallback position. But I'm not I'm not sure that that's true. That may be what ends up happening. But I I think that the progressives in the Senate are absolutely serious about pa- uh, passing this, and I think that if they had a few more votes, they abs- it, it, it probably is the case that this is too radical to pass. But if they had a few more votes, this is absolutely what they would do. Um. Yeah, you know, Maya Angelou has this old saying that when someone shows you who they are, believe them. I think really, like all of us who are concerned about having a healthy economy and this sort of entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is really the golden goose of the American economy, we need to listen to what these politicians are telling us about themselves. And I know so many, you know, people in technology in Silicon Valley just reflexively vote for one side of the aisle because of you know social issues or which really have been settled you know no one's really debating gay marriage or anything like that anymore but yet i just think that so many people in tech are still voting for this side of the aisle and i don't think they've woken up to if you keep voting for more of these radical progressives they are going to dismantle the free enterprise system that we have i mean Again, they call themselves socialists. This is not even this is not like a label I'm applying. This is a label they apply to themselves. It's a very radical movement in American politics and it it doesn't represent the entire Democrat Party, but it's largely hijacked the activists and, you know, probably has over forty of the fifty um Democrat senators. So I think you know People in our in the technology world who are socially liberal but believe in the free enterprise system really need to wake up to the threat here and start being a lot more careful about who they're supporting politically. Now, what's interesting is is um, you know you talked about I think you talked about a third party in some regard to uh, on the All In podcast, and there is you know there, there are these huge structural moats that the two parties have right now. And, you know, th- there's an op-ed today by Gerard Baker in the, the Wall Street Journal, who uh, pre- previous guest on this podcast. But he starts out with um, a quote from his, an Israeli diplomat saying uh, the guy's name was Abba Iban in 1973, saying the Arabs never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And the whole point of the op-ed is to basically go on to say that, you know, the, the other party, which would give an alternative solution, the Republican Party is not offering that solution and they really don't have an agenda right now that would be um, an alternative vision that you know as, as you're saying would be widely popular if it just was based off the free market system didn't deal with social issues and perhaps they have that and they're just not selling it so as far as a, a viable strategy for a third party have you put any thought into you know how that would happen or perhaps you know reshaping the the two parties as it is like how do you how do you think about this because we kind of are locked in. I, I tend to think that, uh, you know, the American system really is a two party system and third parties generally are just spoilers in election. And they, you know, will usually work against one of the two mainstream candidates. Um, 
So I, I tend to think that change happens through one of the two political parties. And if you want to affect change in America, you need to essentially fight and win and seize control over one of the, the two two major parties. I think that's effectively what's happened in the Democratic Party. I mean, the progressives in the party have essentially seized that party. Um, I mean, I remember when Bill Clinton came in and you had this whole um, Democrat Leadership Council, the DLC. And after, you know, more than a decade of losses in um, presidential elections because the Democrats had gotten too far left, Bill Clinton basically reformed the party and moved it more to the center. And that was a very effective strategy. Um, today, the party has moved further left than it ever has. The progressives are where all the energy of the party is. It's, it's all the activists. Um, and they seem to control not all, but I'd say most of the votes. So you really, they, they have succeeded in essentially seizing control of one of the two major parties. Um, I think that kind of narrows down the options here. And um, yes, you could create a third party if you don't like the Republicans, but a better idea might be to work within the Republican Party to try and reform that party in the direction you want. I think one of the, I, I, I think one of the misperceptions I think people have right now about the Republican Party is is there are all these legacy social issues. Um, you know, they do still matter to to groups within the party, but. Um, so many of these issues have already been resolved and just don't matter anymore. And, you know, a great example is like, you know, gay marriage, where everybody basically supports that now. The Supreme Court has already ruled on it. The Republican Party was definitely late to the game on that issue. But and, and, and it was definitely one of the reasons why. I mean, I remember back in, I guess, 2018, you know, I supported Gavin Newsom because he had been good on gay marriage and he had been good on cannabis legalization just to take two social issues where you know, I thought the Republicans were definitely behind the times, but those issues have been taken off the table. Everyone basically ag largely agrees. Certainly, with gay marriage and cannabis is almost there. So I just think that, like, you know, there are other social issues, but um, I think people are going to have to make some tough choices about whether they really support this radical progressive agenda because there just aren't a lot of choices in our political system. I, I will say, you know, the, in terms of actually like flipping a party. So looking this up before this 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 conversation, um, you know, the, the Dem Socialist Party has four members in, in the, the U.S. House. Uh, they have multiple members across city councils um, in the entire country. And then actually this wasn't really widely reported. But on March 6th of this year, the Democratic Socialists actually swept the entire leadership uh, of the Nevada Democratic Party. So they actually own all five party leadership positions and the entire uh, Nevada, the, the, the entire staff that was there just resigned in, in mass in, in, according to this. So I think that actually what we're seeing and it hasn't been reported on right now is that the dumb socialists are actually operating on a, a very disciplined plan to run as both Democrats and Dem socialists and then just continue to flip and flip and flip. And you're seeing this in, in Buffalo as well. They the you know, the, the mayor, the, the, the candidate for mayor actually, um, on the Dem side is Dem socialist and. Right. Um, yeah, you're right. And something very similar has happened in California. I mean, look, if you look at the activists, the shock troops, the people on the ground, the people who are volunteering all of their time and doing protests and organizing and getting out the vote and all this kind of stuff, the, the activists, the energy in the party is absolutely the democratic socialists. And uh, that's that's pretty scary. Um, th this to me, like opposing that is more important to me is a bigger it, it is more important than some of these nuances um, about, you know, as between the old center versus right. You know, um, so what, what I mean by that is I'm happy to support moderate Democrats who will oppose the sort of democratic socialist agenda. I also su support Republicans who will oppose that agenda. To me, the differences between the moderate Democrats like a Clinton and the Republicans are pretty minor. I'd be delighted to have like a Bill Clinton, like, um, you know, president, uh, you know, and, and, and I'd be happy to support politicians like that. Again, I think all those distinctions were very small. I mean, another way of looking at it is, you know, there's an old saying that American politics is fought between the 40 yard lines. You know, that's the way American politics used to be is, you know, the two sides would push the ball back and forth. 
Um, and then occasionally someone would score a field goal, and then even more occasionally someone would score a touchdown and pass some legislation. You know, when politics was like that between the 40 yard lines, like I didn't really feel a need to pay that much attention to it, but it's changed now because progressives are really fighting goal line to goal line. You know, like at stake here is not just some marginal program, but like the entire free enterprise system. I mean, they are outright declaring that they want to replace our capitalist system, capitalist with a social safety net. I support that. They want to replace that with a socialist system. I mean, they're outright saying that. Um, So we're really talking about, you know, they're fighting goal line to goal line. And to me, that is what has to be opposed. And that to me is more important than, you know, minor, like sort of old partisan differences. Yeah, I think a great point there that people don't often think about is is kind of this axis of of involvement versus non involvement, and then the, the necessity to do so. And it is it's 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 actually you know it's kind of annoying to have to pay attention because wait a second, there's there's real repercussions that that could come of this. Yeah, I mean the the you have to kind of look at who the full timers are. Um, <laughs> You know, it, 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 as with anything in life, the people who are doing it full time are the ones who are going to be successful, right? Because they're totally focused. And one of the problems in politics is that the moderates um, and centrists, and I mean, I consider myself one, I mean, we are part timers, right? Like, I'm focused on building companies and making investments in those companies. I don't really want to have to spend my time on politics. It's something I do when I become alarmed by what I'm seeing. And then I try to get involved and make contributions and support things on social media and talk about it on the pod. But the reality is I'm a part-timer. And the people who are full-time, who have devoted their lives to bringing about these like radical changes, I mean, they're doing this nonstop. And um, that's pretty scary, you know? There's a... Uh, y- y- the, the 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 LBJ books by Robert Caro, um, I mean those those are phenomenal, um, and, and it just that that actually is like a great uh, example of what you're talking about. Is you know he and not to say he was like that radical or anything, but um, uh, you know his his work ethic and his drive is like really what set him apart. I mean the fact that he was able to uh, command the Senate in the way he did and have a command even from the presidency of of you know steering legislation and whipping votes was entirely a product of his work ethic um there's actually an anecdote in there when you, you just use the word focus where he was uh he was campaigning for the senate in the he- in a helicopter this was in the 40s and he had four people in the helicopter and the helicopter dropped about 20 feet and hit the ground and and, sp- and spiked all the way back up and um it, it actually it recaught and it, it continued to fly everyone was was going crazy and he didn't notice he was so focused on what he was doing that he didn't even notice. So uh, apply that right. across to, um, you know, that versus part time. It's, it's scary now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, and I think the, so the question you always have to ask is what is the mindset of the people who are the full timers? And, um, and maybe my perspective is a little bit skewed because I'm in California. But when I look at you just go on Twitter, right? You look at who are the people who are the activists who are um, staffing behind the scenes, not just the elected politicians, because they're more careful about what they say, but their chief of staffs and the party leaders and operatives, it's all democratic socialists. So it's, it's the radical activists and yeah, they've dedicated their life to making that change. That, that is what's scary, you know, is if the, if it was just, if the full timers were people who were more moderate or centrist or, or liberal, but you know, if they just wanted a bigger social safety net, as opposed to upend the entire capitalist system, that'd be fine with me. There wouldn't be such a need for me to speak out. But this is what's got me concerned. You know, let's talk about uh, something tangible here, which is which is debt. So back to the the earlier discussion around you know why they need to implement this this aggressive tax around unrealized capital gains is, is the fact that. We simply don't have enough money to pay for the spending, um, despite the fact we've had record revenue year after year after year. Um, you know, our debt continues to rise. You talked about this two episodes. Um, you know, we're at twenty nine trillion right now. Over the next thirty years, we have a baseline of hundred trillion in deficit spending because of uh, retiring boomers and Medicare, uh, Medicaid, and Social Security. Um, 
you know, do, do you have any opening thoughts on this? Because this is, to me, I'm biased here. This is, I think, the most important issue that we face as a country. I think it's the most important issue that nobody ever talks about. Um, I mean, how we, we keep hearing that deficits and debt doesn't matter. Uh, and in fact, you know, I, 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 I'm, I still marvel at this because there's an entire school of economic thought called modern monetary theory that basically has put forth the idea that literally debt doesn't matter. Um, and so I, I, I was just yesterday, I was like Googling this and every single year for like the last 10 years, there are multiple, you know, op-eds written basically with the headline, that debt doesn't matter. And it's just so incredibly irresponsible. I mean, debt doesn't matter until it suddenly matters. And then it matters. It's, it's kind of like that old saying about how did you go bankrupt slowly at first, then suddenly. Um, <laughs> you know, d- 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 debt sort of matters slowly, then suddenly. Yep. And I think we're starting to see concern about it now because inflation has ticked up to 5.1%. It's the first time in a long time that we've had real inflation. And so... The question is, well, how is the Fed going to fight it? Well, typically it would raise interest rates, but if interest rates go revert back to their historical uh, norm, something like 4.9%, I guess on the, on the 10 year treasury, then debt service would grow from 2% of the federal budget, which it is now to 30% of the federal budget. So again, just raising interest rates back to their historical norm to fight inflation if, if inflation persists, that would basically crowd out almost 30% of the federal budget. Um, think about like the choices we're going to have to face as a country at that point, where either you're going to have to have like, you know, massive austerity in the federal budget, or you're going to have to have, you know, massive tax increases, which do have a big impact on economic growth, or you're going to have to monetize the debt by printing. Uh, by basically printing currency to pay for it, which would probably erode the dollar status as world reserve currency and have hugely negative consequences. So, yeah, I mean, we're looking at a bunch of like not good options because we've incurred all this debt. And the question is why? I mean, why, why are we incurring this debt? It's not to fight World War II or something like that. We've incurred it mostly in peacetime. You know, we've gone from... Um, you know, when Bill Clinton was president in the late uh, 90s, we had government surpluses and we were, you know, we were very close actually to paying off the national debt. A few more years of that and of surpluses, and I think we would have paid off the national debt. And instead, we've kind of the last 20 years have been a fiasco and both parties are to blame. I mean, George W. Bush kind of started it with with all these, um, you know, I'd say foolish wars in the, in the Middle East. We wasted trillions in the Middle East on nation building, um, fighting these wars to liberate people who didn't want us to be there. Uh, that was a disaster. Um, and now we, you know, the progressives seem hell bent on spending far more on social programs than we have the, than we can afford. So, um, you know, both parties are sort of have, have created this problem. Yeah. What's interesting, um, you know, to go back a little bit earlier, is I've actually been a little bit surprised that there hasn't been like a Tea Party that has has sprung up. Um, you know, before you know, in in lieu of kind of these onerous uh, proposals from from the current administration, um, because they're really you know within the same vein of what happened last time. I think there's other factors that go into it, like the fact that we were in a recession at that time. Um, you know, you probably have different uh, age demographics right now, um, but. Uh, you know, it, it, right now it seems like the the stakes are are definitely higher. Yet there isn't kind of this backlash right now. But the people in the Tea Parties back then, and this is this is kind of what uh, our last president saw tapped into, is you know th- they were just as mad at the, the the GOP as they were at the the Democrats. Um, and that's exactly how you know Trump won the nomination is because he saw that. Um, you know, the, the problem with the thing that people don't talk about in terms of uh, the debt uh, that really doesn't get out there as much is that we're, we're actually, you know, basically just rolling over our debt. So average maturity is 60 months on the debt. So we're not even locking in these rates. So basically, we roll over our debt on average um, every five years. And what's going to happen is the entirety of the debt, that means, is basically going to be paid 
um, at these higher interest rates. Um, if they right. Rise. Well, th- this, is, this is exactly why the Fed's degrees of freedom are so limited is because if they do want to combat inflation by raising rates, our debt service is going to go through the roof. Um, again, it'll go from 2% to 30% of the federal budget if they raise interest rates to the historical norm of 4.9%. I think I'm talking about the 10-year treasury. So this is the problem. I mean, Trump actually had an interesting idea. Uh, I don't really know why it didn't go anywhere, but I heard it floated a few years ago, which was to uh, lock in our debt, at, uh, to basically issue 100-year T-bills. <laughs> You remember this? And so they could have locked yeah. in uh, when, when rates were at some insanely low number. I don't know why that never went anywhere, but it would have been a great idea to lock in, you know, at least 20 or 30 year rates when they were just at extremely low. I guess Trump being the real estate guy would kind of understand this principle. But yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know why that was never <laughs> done. And as a result, I think, yeah, we are going to be at the mercy. We're, we're going to be between a rock and a hard place. The, the rock being inflation and the the hard place being uh, debt service going through the roof if the Fed wants to raise rates to to fight inflation. Um, all, 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 all of which is to say that like piling on more debt yeah, right because now just seems like the wrong idea. We had $6 trillion of deficit spending last year in the middle of covid now the administration wants to spend another six trillion plus this year. Uh, the economy is doing great, by the way. I mean, we are in peacetime. The economy is booming. We've never had this kind of proposed deficit spending uh, in peacetime. And so, you know, what is the point of this? You know. Well, here's here's the upshot too. Uh, you know, there's there's kind of like this this meme that that China owns all the debt. But foreigners, um, specifically China, have not bought uh, our debt in over 10 years. So they, they have stopped purchasing it. And in fact, um, even uh, domestic buyers who are now the, the, the primary purchasers of our debt uh, ha- have stopped in terms of allowing the interest rate or keeping the interest rate low. Right. So the interest rate is being artificially held down by the fact that the Fed is now buying a majority of new debt issued. Yeah. So. It's, uh, so, so it's now being th- those interest rates. That's that's the scariest part. Is those interest rates are being artificially held down. Those aren't even market rates. So yeah. that inflation piece is they're going to have to continue to inflate uh, inflate the value of the dollar in order to do that. Now, l- let me ask you this: as someone who's gone out and raised um, you know billions of dollars in terms of you know LPs for craft and also your companies, you know, do you have any insight? And also. Uh, Shout out to the all in pod, you know, trading Japanese bonds or something during your, your poker game. Uh, do, do you have any insight into, um, you know, the, the credit markets in terms of the domestic demand for U.S. treasuries right now? You know, I, I don't have any real special insight there. I mean, I don't really participate in markets from like a global macro perspective we're just so micro you know i it's true we go out and raise money for our funds but we're we're just totally focused on investing in companies at the earliest stages and we're pretty insulated from what's happening in in the global markets um but uh but yeah look you you raise you raise a great point here you know um there's an interesting site here called usdebtclock.org which everyone can go to and um, it's kind of got this like uh, debt clock on the U.S. national debt, which is right now running at twenty eight point nine trillion. The debt per citizen of the U.S. is eighty six thousand dollars. The debt per taxpayer in the U.S. is two hundred twenty nine thousand dollars per taxpayer. And you know this money has to be paid back. There's no like all debt must be paid back at some point. And um, you know, I, I just the the question is why are we incurring so much debt? Why are we living beyond our means like this? Um, in terms of these like specific programs, I'm not really against like any of the specific programs. I just think we have to live within our means, and we have a great system in the U.S., which is we have a free enterprise system that generates prosperity and innovation, and the economy keeps growing, and then government will get its take, which historically has been around twenty percent. Um, if you go back over the last 50 years, it squiggles up or down by about 2%, depending on whether you're in a recession or not. But it's amazing how consistent the federal share, the federal uh, tax receipts as a percentage of GDP are, even with wildly different 
uh, top marginal income tax rates, the federal government seems to get around 20% right. uh, of, of GDP. And we could discuss, there's a whole bunch of reasons why I think it's harder to go above that. But the point is that the federal government will get its take of this growth. It will get roughly 20% of GDP. GDP keeps growing. That's the, the golden goose is the free enterprise system. And then that 20% will be used to fund basically the social safety net and progressive programs. I have no problem with that basic construct. That is the way I think it should work. Over time, as the economy gets bigger and bigger, we'll be able to fund more and more programs and we'll be able to be more and more generous with people over time and fund more and more things. But what doesn't work is when you break that system or upend it and you say you want to replace the free enterprise system with socialism, like that, wh- why would you do that? I mean, it, it's really like a form of impatience, I guess, where if we're patient over time, the prosperity that the, this system, the American system will continue creating will fund all the programs we need. But, you know, it just seems like people can't wait and they're willing to incur massive deficits and debt uh, now to pay for the programs at the risk of breaking the entire system. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see the, you know, if there's any good research on, I mean, it's, it's empirically true, right? So I'm looking at the chart now, it's 1940 to, to 2020, it, it always tops out at, at 20% of federal revenue. So if we have a debt of 200% of GDP, which we will have soon, um, you know, paying it off with only 10%, which is, you know, 20% over 200% is just not, it's not going to happen without um, somehow becoming, uh, without soaking the middle class. But let's, uh, let, let, let's shift gears here, because I think people have, have gotten the point that they need to start paying attention <laughs> to that. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, producer of Thank You for Smoking, um, great movie if no one's ever seen it. Uh, the Mod Squad, so Merchants of Death was uh, alcohol, tobacco, firearms uh, i believe um who would be the mod squad today would you would you swap anyone out for for anyone any different uh, merchants of death today that, that's funny yeah you know at the very end of the movie there's kind of a, a recap in which um the mod squad it, where nick naylor the main character is kind of narrating and he mentions that the mod squad has a few new members and i think they were i i would i did a cameo in there for about two seconds where I was one of them. I think I was like the uh, oil lobbyist. Uh, <laughs> I think another one was maybe fast food. And then I, don't, I forgot what the third one was, like radioactive waste. I mean, I guess I know the one that they're trying to add to the mod squad right now, which is social media. They're trying to make social networking companies to be out, out to be the new cigarettes. And this is the thing we've heard now for years is that social networking is like nicotine. I just like totally reject that. I think it's absurd. Um, it's a metaphor that's been taken way too far. I don't even really believe that social networking is very addictive. I think it's a mildly diverting amusement that occasionally yields useful information. Um, if I were to poll everyone listening to us right now and ask them, are you addicted to social media? Uh, are you uh, being programmed by it? Are you being brainwashed? Every single person would say no. Um, so this is something that we don't believe about ourselves, but somehow we've bought into this narrative that it applies to everybody else. And, um, you know, there's a sharp dichotomy, in other words, between how we perceive our own usage and how we perceive everybody other, else's usage. And I would submit that, you know, our own usage is what we know to be true and what we know to be the case. And everybody else's usage is a narrative that's been constructed for us. And I think we, should, we shouldn't just automatically buy into that. Right. There's, there's probably some sort of normal distribution around uh, social media addiction. And, um, you know, it's, again, it's, it's pretty easy to craft a narrative when you get, you know, a few. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even believe people are addicted. You know, I think they just like using the products. I mean, look, I guess I've got like a Twitter addiction. I probably do. I've got like a phone addiction. Um, but it's not like something I'm like unaware of. It's just I like using the products. Um, and I think we should just understand that there's a real agenda behind uh, trying to characterize uh, social media as a health hazard, which is they want to regulate the content that appears on these social networks. Um, and they, they don't like the idea of consumer choice. They don't like the idea that users are, are, um, are y- using the services they like and, and consuming the information they want. They want to have more control over the information you get in your newsfeed. And um, this is not some conspiracy theory on my part this is what the senators on the senate district committee have said over and over again 
this is what Frances Hoggins suggested when she testified is that they needed a new regulatory agent like the FCC that be staffed by, with people like her who would control what you see in your newsfeed. So that's what's really going on here is that social media is suffering all these blistering attacks because there's an agenda of censorship. And the crazy thing is that the media supports it. Um, the politicians in power support it. But we should understand that if we give into this, it's simply going to result in uh, a loss of control over the information we consume and our own choices will be substituted for people in power who want to make those choices for us. You know, it, it, it just seems like uh, one of those things that, you know, they, they think that they're going to be able to regulate it. But, you know, Mar- Martin Gurry, who I interviewed, um, is the first guest on my podcast, and I interviewed him on, on Colin as well. You know, he likes to say that information is redundant and it just can't be switched off in what he likes to call the, the Mubarak switch, um, in which Hosni and Mubarak could cut off the Internet uh, but the the information still got out, even in something that drastic. Yeah, I mean, I think I think trying to I think there is a an aspect of futility to trying to regulate um, content or speech on the internet. Um, you know, you're all you're always going to have this sort of one percent problem, and I think what what Facebook and Twitter have found out is that no matter no matter how many content moderators they hire, there's always going to be that small percentage of content that gets through that causes problems. Um, and the more you try to tamp down on that 1% and, you know, um, try to make it 0.1%, the more innocent people get caught up in the dragnet and then they get their accounts frozen and suspended too. I remember, um, you know, Rand Paul, the, uh, the, the father or not Ron, Ron Paul, rather, um, he's the father of Rand Paul, the U S Senator. He got swept up in this and he got his Facebook account frozen well, of course, as soon as he publicized that fact, Facebook unfroze it and apologized and said it was an accident. But that's because he's a famous person and his son is a U.S. senator. I mean, what about the rest of us? Uh, what happens when Facebook accidentally freezes your account or um, shuts you down because they've got you know these thousands of content moderators who are trying to stamp out every last piece of problematic content? And the more we try to stamp it out, again, the more false positives we get. And the more innocent people have their right to, to speech taken away. So I think, you know, this has become uh, – we, we should just understand that there are serious trade-offs here in trying to um, tamp down on speech that we think is problematic. It, you know, back to what you were earlier saying around implementing policy that's, that's you know, it's, it's haphazard. I mean, this just seems – like it, it is being done haphazardly. I mean, in terms of studying this stuff, it, it really is done almost uh, almost vindictively opposed to just from a, a blank slate approach of figuring out, okay, what does the communication law look like for the 21st century? Um, no, let me, let me ask you, uh, or did you want to make a point there? Well, I just think that the internet is a platform for, the ordinary person to be able to have speech rights and to be able to speak. And it, it's the new town square. I mean, when the U S constitution was written and they, you know, there's a very important part of the first amendment, which is it wasn't just a right to, to free speech and a free press, but also the right to assemble. And because that's the way that speech took place is you go to the, you'd assemble in the town square and people would get on a soapbox and they would talk. Well, where do people assemble today? They assemble on social networks. That is where speech takes place. It is the new town square. The town square essentially has been digitized. And it's also been privatized because the town square is now owned by these private companies. Um, if the town square were still public, it would be a violation of the First Amendment to try and regulate the ways that people are, are speaking. Um, but because these companies are private, they're, the politicians can make an end run around the first amendment and try to pressure Facebook and Twitter and these other social networks to engage in censorship. And that's basically what's been happening. You look look at all these hearings on, um, you know, on congressional Hill and it's always the same thing, which is that Zuckerberg and Dorsey are being lectured by the senators to take down more content. And they're basically being threatened with antitrust violations and break up of their companies. If they don't, exceed to the will of these centers to take down more content. Um, so we, it's a really um, bizarre situation in which, uh, again, the, the town square has now been privatized. And as a result of that, 
it can now indirectly be influenced and controlled by the people in power. This is the exact thing that the First Amendment was designed to prevent. We know that people in power will always try to censor speech and prevent people from criticizing them if we give them the opportunity. This is why the First Amendment exists. It's one of our fundamental freedoms. And, um, you know, I think we should just be like really careful to understand that all these attacks on social networks are motivated by an agenda. And that agenda is very much simpatico with the desires of people in power to control what the ordinary person can, um, can say or consume. Well, I, I have not thought of the freedom of assembly uh, part of that. So that, that is an excellent point that I think people should, should definitely take into consideration. Um, I know we got to get out of here. The last yep. question I want to ask you here <laughs> is, uh, is, is around, um, you know, back to, to, to uh, thank you for smoking. You know, Nick Naylor, he goes to uh, Hollywood and he wants to get a movie made for the purpose of influencing Americans on his issue. Now, right now, the CCP is obviously doing that, uh, not only with their own movie. So there's this movie that just came out retelling the Korean War where we're the bad guys um, and it, it paints the, the Chinese army in a heroic light. But you also have them influencing Hollywood in terms of, you know, they, they the CCP got MGM to spend a million dollars to re-edit the remaking of Red Dawn and swapping out, you know, China for North Korean, the North Korean army. Um, you know, do, do you, w- w- why are we unwilling as Americans to play this game, to understand, you know, that cultural means of production do influence the, the, you know, the, the, the nation at large? Well, something very interesting has happened here. If you go back to say the early nineties, when we started to it really even happened before then, but it really happened in earnest in the nineties where, when Bill Clinton gave China a uh, temporary uh, MFN, basically most favored nations um, status. And then uh, George W. Bush, when he came in, made that status permanent. Um, the, the whole theory in terms of engaging China by opening up our markets to them and engaging in trade was that it would make them more like us. They would basically, if we got them to liberalize economically, then they would liberalize politically and essentially we would influence them to be more like us. Not only did that not happen, you know, not only did, I mean, what we basically enabled China to do was to modernize, but they certainly didn't Westernize. And in fact, the opposite happened, which is they have influenced us. And the way they have influenced us is that China represents such an enormous market. It's such a lucrative opportunity for companies to be able to have access to their market that companies in the U.S. are willing to sort of muzzle and muffle what they're willing to say about China in order to get access to that market. And I think Hollywood is a really good example that they're being very careful about the product they're putting out because they don't want to do anything to offend uh, the the CCP. Um, something very similar happened with the NBA, right? When Daryl Morey, the, one of the GMs in the NBA, published a very innocuous tweet, I think, supporting the people of Hong Kong, he was absolutely shouted down by you know everyone in the NBA because they thought he was jeopardizing their ability to make money in China, and so you know China has used their has used their market access to influence us, and we really didn't require China to do anything in order to get access to our market. So we threw open our markets to their products, which resulted in millions of manufacturing jobs basically being exported to to China that created huge political consequences in the U S is one of the main reasons Trump got elected is because of this policy. And what did we get in exchange for that? We never really demanded anything in exchange for giving them access to our markets. So I think the relationship has been very lopsided in that respect. And we should be thinking about, you know, if they're going to put conditions on access to their market, then why aren't we putting similar conditions on access to our markets? Yeah, it certainly seems like they learned the lessons of uh, the, the Soviet Union, took the, the good and the bad and, and incorporated. Well, yeah, the, 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 well, um, the, 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 this is something that I think Xi has been very clear about is, and, and really the the leaders before him is that they saw they absolutely saw what happened with Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. And they know that the max, maximum moment of peril for any autocratic regime is at the moment when they try to reform anything. 
And so they, they've been very clear that they don't want what happened to Gorbachev to happen to them, which is to say that they, they were willing to um, re- reform they were willing to introduce market-based reform, which is sort of like perestroika, but not glasnost. And in fact, they've been cracking down more uh, politically uh, in order to have a firmer hand at the same time that they've been opening up their markets to entrepreneurs. Now, I, I always say that that's been true for 20 years. Um, under Xi, it's changing a little bit where they seem to be cracking down on markets too and entrepreneurs cutting down the billionaires to size in their country. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens from here. Right. Perhaps they perhaps they uh, had had some sort of statutory limit uh, behind the scenes on, on how much they would leverage the market to get to get their ends. But um, all right. So we're, we're pushing up in an hour here. I think we just went over. So I just want to say thank you. <laughs> um, thanks for coming on. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye bye.